It's Thursday, August the 8th, 2024. Welcome to the Daily Article Podcast. Today's article is written by Dr. Jim Dennison and narrated by Chris Elkins of the Dennison Forum. The news of the week has been monumental, to say the least, from unprecedented political developments to weather-related disasters to the specter of an escalating war in the Middle East. So, for a day, let's take a break from all of that to consider a whimsical headline that may be a sign of our times. AI-powered necklace will be your friend for $99. Dubbed, quote-unquote, the friend, this pendant is about the size of an Apple AirTag. Avi Schiffman, the 21-year-old Harvard dropout who invented it, told Wired that he created the device at a time when he had never felt more lonely in my entire life. The onboard microphone listens to everything happening around you. Powered by AI, it will answer questions but also send unprompted messages to engage in conversation and offer encouragement. In other words, it's a technological companion to make up for the real thing. It should not surprise us that Schiffman is in search of friends. His Gen Z cohort reports the poorest mental health of any generation in America as they struggle with alarming rates of loneliness, depression, and suicidal thoughts. They are also our nation's least religious generation. Perhaps there's a correlation, if not a causation here. By contrast, actively religious people are more likely to describe themselves as very happy, healthier, with greater longevity, better coping skills, and less anxiety, depression, and suicide. More psychologically resilient, with a higher quality of life, better able to handle economic uncertainty and downturns. Why, then, aren't more Americans more religious? When I was a small boy, I wanted to fly more than anything. I used to lay in the grass, look up into the clouds, and imagine soaring among them like Superman. So, one day, I took some bed sheets and used them to make myself wings. I then climbed up on the roof of our house and jumped off. My childhood mind truly believed that I would be able to fly when I did so, that the reality of gravity would submit to the reality of my newfound ability. But I was wrong, and lucky I didn't break a leg. Now, consider the one who truly can supersede the laws of the world he created. As we read in Psalm 47, verses 7 and 8, God is the king of all the earth. God reigns over the nations. God sits on his holy throne. This is a present tense fact, no matter what circumstances might seem to say. Our problem is that we judge objective reality by our subjective experiences rather than the other way around. As a result, we are, quote-unquote, breaking bones right and left. According to recent Gallup polling, 54% of Americans consider abortion to be morally acceptable. 53% support doctor-assisted suicide, a higher number than those who agree with medical testing on animals at 48%. 69% find sex between an unmarried man and woman to be morally acceptable. 64% support gay or lesbian relations. 23% support polygamy, up from 7% 20 years ago. Are we surprised that only 5% of us are very satisfied with the moral climate of our nation? How does our week-long focus on God's transforming love relate to today's conversation? In a way we might not expect. In Smoke on the Mountain, an interpretation of the Ten Commandments, Joy Davidman, the wife of C.S. Lewis, asked, Mustn't the church adapt Christianity to suit the ideas of our time? Then she answered her question, quote, No. They must not. Our ideas are killing us spiritually. When your child swallows poison, you don't sit around thinking of ways to adapt his constitution to a poisonous diet. You give him an emetic, medicine that induces vomiting. God wants to do the same for us. It is because our Father loves his children so fervently that he hates everything that is not best for us. When our oldest son and our youngest grandson were diagnosed with cancer, I hated the disease with a passion beyond words. This is how our Lord feels about the sin that tempts us. Of course, our spiritual enemy feels just the opposite. According to Jesus in John 10 verse 10, Satan comes only to steal and kill and destroy. So, the next time temptation arises, ask yourself, what will this steal? Whom will it kill? How will it destroy? If the answers are not apparent, ask the Spirit to reveal them to you. 
And remember from 1 John 4, verse 8, that God is love. If his word forbids something, it must be because it's harmful for you. If he commands something, it must be because it's best for you. His unchanging character requires it. Now, ask his spirit to empower you to think, speak, and act biblically in response to your temptations and all through your day. And when you do, you will experience the transforming love and abiding presence of your Lord in ways no technology or human could ever match. I will always remember seeing Michelangelo's massive statue of David for the first time, standing 17 feet tall in the Galleria dell'Accademia in Florence, Italy. It towers over those who come to view it. It took the famed Renaissance artist nearly three years to complete it, chipping away at a large block of marble until the masterpiece was completed. When the Pope asked the sculptor the secret of his genius, Michelangelo responded, It's simple. I just removed everything that was not David. If you were to resemble Jesus, the son of David, according to Matthew 1.1, more fully than ever before, what would your divine sculptor change today? Listeners like you support Denison Form's mission to deliver news discerned differently. As a ministry nonprofit, we are fully donor-supported. To partner with us, please donate today using the donate link in our show notes.